Welcome back to another episode of Talking Dairy. Now, as we all know, milk prices have been strong over the past couple of seasons. However, we're now also experiencing pressures associated with a reduced national milk volume and a negative trend in milk price projections. This revenue pressure, combined with fast rising input costs and significant interest rate hikes, is putting a major squeeze on farm businesses' profit margins. So how are farmers managing their way through the current economic climate to maintain their profitability? In our last episode, we heard from West Coast owner-operator Dan King and Waikato contract milker and 50-50 share milker Mark Jones. In this episode, you'll hear from two more farmers on this topic. We're joined by owner-operator John Blewett, who farms in Tapahu, Waikato, and Canterbury's Kylie Marriott, who's a herd-owning lower-order share milker. John and Kylie have generously agreed to share their approach to coping with cost increases, how they calculate profit from various inputs, and how they go about budgeting when things are changing so quickly. My name is Ben Chapman-Smith, and I hope you enjoy this episode. And just a quick note, if you're looking for a great course to help you manage the numbers in your farming business, check out Dairy Training Limited's Business by the Numbers. Dairy Training, a subsidiary of Dairy NZ, is aiming to run this course in every region in 2023, and courses start as soon as February. Go to dairytraining.co.nz forward slash bbtn to learn more. And if you haven't already done so, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you get notified when new episodes go live. Let's get started. John and Kylie, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. To kick things off, John, could you tell us a bit about yourself, please? Whereabouts are you farming? How long have you been there? And how long have you been dairy farming for? With my wife, Jill, we we farm at Tipahu, which is just out in front of Mount, Mount Prongia. And we operate a um, 230 hectare dairy unit milking 670 cows with a 43 hectare support block just two k's away. We have been there 18 years and 18 years ago we set up a family equity partnership with uh, with our adult children. So three of our adult children uh, are in the ownership. Also our son Nathan and his wife Ashley, they run a 236 hectare dairy unit and 65 hectare support block at Rangatoto Te Kawiri. and the two farms inter- interact, to- interact together. And Nathan's been there for, for seven years. Um, we started farming in 1980 and uh, we leased a farm next door to where we are actually now. And two years later in 1982 bought a, bought a um, dairy unit down at Rangatoto and we've expanded over the years. We've probably bought and sold 13 farms in that time. And just recently, the 1st of June, we will add another 51 hectares to the present dairy unit. And Kylie, how about you? Whereabouts are you farming and how long have you been there for? Cool. So my husband, Nick and I, we're in our fifth season on a dairy holdings farm and we're about 25 minutes south of Ashburton. Um, so we started with dairy holdings as contract milkers and this season we've just changed over to lower order share milkers and we actually worked out last night that we've been in the dairy industry for, for 21 years. So. Kylie, talk us through how you've got to where you are now in your business structure, how you've gone from contract milking to lower order share milking. Okay, so 2018 we took out a loan to fund 100% buying our equipment with, with dairy holdings. Uh, their contracts are slightly different to the normal, I guess you'd say, uh, contract milk contracts. So they have the ability for us to rear additional replacement heifers to then graze ourselves within the dairy holding system and introduce them into the herd as well. So, so since 2018, we've been rearing extra stock for ourselves as well as purchasing some mixed age cows when they come available. So, so yes, yeah, so this season we were uh, owning over half the herd. So we changed over from the contract milking over to the lower order uh, share milk contract. And then we've just recently had confirmed that next season we'll have 82% herd ownership and the following season hopefully will be full herd ownership. So, so we're milking uh, 970 cows peak milk. So I mean, that's a, a massive achievement and yeah, just that equity growth that we have under that system is just, it's not very common nowadays, but yeah, it's just been 
it's been massive for us yeah thanks kylie for explaining that to us tell us about your farm production system and also what kind of assumptions such as medium term milk price supplement costs etc have you used to establish that system so we are a low input farm, so we're, we'd be system two and uh, we run 100% pasture base. So our farm system is really established by, by the Dairy Holdings lead team. They calculate the, each farm's individual expected costs and establish the expected income to get to our contract rates. So no farm within their system is, is the same. Um, and they needed to keep our farm system simple and repeatable just simply due to the size size of their business. That suits us fine. Um, we've always been low input farmers and the, with the current prices on feed and costs skyrocketing, I mean, we're quite happy to have that low input system in our accounts and that certainly reflect that. Uh, so our, our, the, the milk price and stuff, we just go off for our personal budgets we go off what the bank recommends um, and our, like our winter grazing in those big sort of costs are already locked in now for next season uh, so we've got that, that certain amount of security around uh, those sorts of costs of production. Mm, that's great thanks Kylie and what about you John? Yeah you know, our, our system we're a, a system two and if it's a dry season we end up being a system three so we, we bring in feed when we actually need to the the feeds that we use strategically at three times uh, maize silage which is used once the cows calve through to start a mating and then we carry over 130 ton of maize silage instead of using a summer crop to get through the summer and then there's probably another 130 ton that we use once at the end end of the season to get cow condition back on and palm kernel, we use that uh, along with the maize silage, depending on the quantities that, that we actually need. So basically, we've got a feed pad, so we, we feed on that the, the three times the three times of the year. And a lot of the feed we grow on the maize silage, we grow on the dairy unit, and also grow it on the um, on, on the support block that we've actually got. So we end up buying in. This year, we changed the policy with the cost of maize being a lot higher. We have just put a new effluent system in 18 months ago and got the solids. All the solids went on the dairy platform on paddocks that we wanted to regrass. And so that cost kept the cost of growing the maize silage a lot cheaper. So that's one of the changes we've made with, with the way the farm costs have gone. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, also we have a very high, probably double the national average dairy cattle income because we sell 10% of our herd at the end of each year as in calf cows. So we need more supplement right at the end to carry those cows through to the changeover of the 1st of June. So that's probably a difference in our policy that we actually do. But the revenue stream that we get out of selling those surplus cows is, helps the business. Yeah, sure. You touched on a couple of these things there, John, but with farm costs increasing like so rapidly, what's been your approach to dealing with that? Our, our approach with dealing with that is we could see all the increases in costs coming through the, this year. If you go back two seasons ago, our on-farm costs were four bucks. We got a 31st of March balance date, and I knew about this time last year that it had risen to $4.80. And also I could see the increase in, in a lot of the costs. So we actually put on more fertiliser than more potash because we knew that was that was increasing, which means we don't have to put it on this year, the same, same amount at a higher price. The other thing we did was we bought a lot of our uh, the farm chemicals because the cost of fuel and oil was going up. All those related costs were going. So we, we forward bought and stuff like that. But the other thing we did was we did change the, the maize growing the feed input costs and the other thing, we more strategically, um, at the times when palm kernel contracts were cheaper, we we signed them up and we're having both farms, we were able to negotiate. One of us would take a contract at different times and we our, either farm could use it. So we use strategies like that to try and keep the feed costs, feed costs down. Feed costs probably this year, what's well, gone from 35 cents bought in last year to probably 43 this year. And hopefully um, now with the cost of shipping for palm kernel, it should actually come down cheaper. 
but the cost of actually growing the maize and harvesting, that's where the biggest increase in the fertiliser cost of that has actually come in. And the other thing is, the other option we did look at is whether we dropped our cow numbers and didn't put as much feed in, but we decided on both farms we carried on with the same feed inputs. But try and negotiate the best price that you can for those feeds. And uh, the other a lot of the other farm costs uh, that have gone up, we, we've always had a low cost farm structure and any development work that we do, I know what we're doing in future and Nathan's the same on his farm. That if we know we've got big projects coming up, when, when the materials are cheap, we buy them ahead of time. So it actually keeps the overall costs down. And also we have good relationships with our contractors. That uh, it's a win-win situation with both of us. And we work, work together with them. And that, so so that, that actually helps hold our, our farm cost structure. And also the buying power between the two farms that we have actually lowers a lot of the costs that we actually get things. So... But every time you go onto a farm store now, you you guys will notice everything's going up. <laughs> so it's a matter of knowing what you need. And I guess one of the things I've always known is the physical inputs I need in a year. And when they're cheap, I buy them. So knowing those things, what you're going to need for on farms throughout the year and when they're cheap, you actually buy them. And that's probably something we can do at the moment. The other thing is uh, you've got a telephone, use that, ring round, get prices. And that's what we do to actually try and hold our costs. That's fantastic. Thanks, John. And how about you, Kylie? Yeah, well, we're, we're also lucky too, being that lower input system, we haven't really needed to make too many changes on, on our level. I mean, we still watch every line in the budget. We too shop around, uh, especially for the bigger purchases. We have got the advantage also of the, of the buying power with dairy holdings that trickles right down through their team through to the contract milkers. Yeah, so our costs are already at a minimum. We keep up with the R and M on everything, so then you don't have a have a major. Well, hopefully you don't have a major expense. You know, if you do let that lapse, yeah. So it's just really keeping an eye on on the budgets and the cash flow, and and yeah, really really shop around because and and getting your staff to understand the cost of things as well. You know, show them how much things actually cost, so then that gives them a little bit of um, sense of reality of you know why we ask them. To, to look after equipment and, and do the maintenance as well. So get them on board as well, which is, has made a big change on our farm as well. Yeah, thanks, Kylie. Hey, look, I'm interested in knowing, like, what are your farm business principles and have they been useful in the current economic environment? Uh, well, Nick and I, we, we spoke last night and, we're, and we've both been very debt adverse all, our whole lives, really. Uh, so when we started the contract milk business, we we made the decision together that instead of going out and buying everything new and and flash, just to, um, we we made that decision to buy good quality secondhand gear, and that was to keep our debt level low. I mean, it still did the job, and just to keep up on the R and M on them to to make them last longer, and it and it has served us well. So debt reduction is still a, you know at the forefront of our business. We don't like debt, so we get it down as quickly as we can. We don't have personal HPs. And the other big thing for us is to keep our drawings to a minimum. And we've consistently had it, even with bringing up four children, around that 60 to 65K per year. And that's so we can reinvest the surplus into our business. We also invested in technology when we first got to the farm. We put cut removers in. That was to increase productivity and to keep our labour costs down. It's given us the flexibility that if staff are on holiday, or sick, which came ahead with COVID, we could run the shed with one person. And, and if times got really, really tough, well, we, we could drop a labour unit and make the most of the cut removers. So they've been a really good investment and we definitely don't regret putting them into the shed. Mm. Have you invested in any other forms of technology? No, no, just, just the cut removers. Our, our farm's simple, the shed flow's mm. great. And I mean, Nick still likes to keep his pulse on, you know, during mating and that. He still does it all, his, all his, himself and gets a good result. So, so yeah, keep, yeah. we keep everything else simple. Yeah. Yeah, so that's super interesting that you and Nick both have this aversion to debt and, you know, a drive to get out of it as quickly as possible. Did you both grow up like that or is it a mentality that you've developed over the years? Yeah, both of us grew up that with our parents, if you couldn't afford it, don't buy it. Uh, so, I mean, that was a steep learning curve for us as our business grew was, well, you actually need to take on more debt 
to to grow and that really scared us and we and with the support of Dairy Holdings and Grant Paulson from KPMG you know if we didn't have those people giving us that little push and saying hey you can actually do it and running those sensitivity reports to actually say you know you 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 know you can breeze in so I mean that was our upbringing and but we've still got it on our you know on our planning wheel from mark and measure that our debt that debt will be gone um, it might have grown and we might have some dirt by then, but at least we're working to get that debt down and at a comfortable level for us. Yeah. Mm, that's, yeah, that's really cool. Thanks, Kylie. Hey, and John, what about you? Uh, what are your farm business principles and how useful have they been in the current economic climate? Yeah, probably uh, probably one of, the, one of the key areas is cash is king. And basically, I think in every year, the 43 years we've been farming, We've made good profits, even at low payouts, by holding costs, and the uh, and also rolling cash aboard in the high years to actually get you get you through the low years. The other thing quite strong on is the cash book, which is regularly done each year, done monthly. And the other thing that we do is we know where all our farm costs are, even things like um, animal health. I break down to subsections like what's my status what's feet, what's breeding, what's feet, and all those other things. So you actually, and repairs and maintenance is broken down into about eight or nine areas. And feed's broken down into everything from harvesting to bought in feed to calf rearing and all those other things. So you have a finger on the pulse of where your actual, your actual money is going. The other, the other thing I alluded to earlier on is that we actually um, know ahead of the game what the plan is for projects on farm. And when we do them, and we know what we need in resources, and when those resources are cheap, we buy them ahead of time. So I've actually got them there to do. And the other thing that we do financially is over the years, we learned this the hard way probably 30 odd years, 35 years ago, not having feed reserves. So we actually carry high feed reserves ahead of ourselves. And in years when there's been major droughts and there's no feed available, we've always had feed and then replace them the following year. So that's the financial principles is having good feed reserves. And the other one is good stock uh, and good stockmanship, low death rates, uh, low um, culling rates and diseases and stuff like that has actually dropped us a lot of money over the years and has allowed us to not only grow the business, but also have the cash to do other things. And the other thing, debt, we have also we've borrowed a lot of money over the years, up and down. And paying principal off is quite critical. And when we every time we expanded, we actually the first three years is what I call consolidation. So you pay off as much debt as you can to actually get yourself ready for the next deal and things like that. And when you when we do the budgets, we do the budgets regularly, review them every two to three months, and then we know what the cash reserves are going to drop out at the end of the season, and then we decide how we're actually going to use that, whether we invest something else, pay off debt or and other things like that. And also for us, a lot of our money goes to charity. So that's quite an important thing that uh, the profit that drops out of the dairy unit goes for a lot of charitable services throughout the community. So we we actually do that. So that's one of the drivers of our, of our financial business. The other thing at the moment, right now, I've just, we've got 31st of March balance date. And I know this year's profit is going to be down 120, 130,000 on last year but we paid provisional tax on last year plus 5%. So there's going to be $40,000, $50,000 of actual provisional tax that we won't need to pay in the, on the 7th of May. So doing those things and, and managing your cash flow is pretty important. And it's been a business principle that we've used over the years, knowing what cash we have. And in times we've held the cash and it's got us through the downturns or given us the cash to actually expand We've just done an expansion for the 1st of June now, and a million of that has come out of our own cash, and 1.5 million is borrowed. Mm. So it just allows you to actually do things. So uh, so that's why this year we're probably screwed on the cost because we know what we've done. We've got all the cows surplus. We won't be selling cows this year, but, but we've got those. So those are things that in the business planning that you actually do and see where you're going. And the other thing is good relationships with your bank managers and monitoring your cash flow is important. Overdraft, very often we have an overdraft facility, but try not to use it. 
and only strategically. So that's how we do it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, John. And thanks to both of you for sharing, you know, those principles that you operate your business by. Uh, Kylie, back to you. Talk to us about like, how do you calculate the profit on various inputs such as supplements? So with our farm system, we don't actually like have supplements. Uh, where the board and feed's just used to to maintain the round length and and the cow condition. Um, so we act early on that. So so that's potentially we we don't really do mm. those calculations where we are now. Yeah, for us we um, we set a certain cost level and it depends on payout and also what we can source the feed for. We strategic how we actually get it and have pretty good relationships with the local contractors that get us the feed. The other thing is basically the profit is depending, particularly in the Waikato, where we get very variable seasons and the growth that we actually harvest through the cows, that sometimes you actually have to put the feed in just to hold cow condition and other things like that. And the other thing that we strategically do is if need be, if it's a drought, we will draw off earlier and take the production hit rather than actually buying it, buying in feed. And it's looking after those cows, getting them up to condition score at calving is one of the key drivers. So if we need to put feed in, we actually do. Last year, we actually ended up contract maize. We were 30 tonnes short on the contract because the crops didn't grow. So we had to, we had to fill that in with palm kernel, which we got caught paying $520 a tonne. But we had to have those cows back in condition. So it's feed. Feed for cow condition is, is critical in the autumn because the modern dairy cow we've got now uses body condition score. And the only way you've got to put the feed in to actually get that condition score back on those. And that relates through to your mating performance and, and cows at calving and things like that. So that's probably one of the key areas that, that is non-negotiable, getting cow condition back on. Hmm. John, when do you start your budgeting process? Uh, next next year's budget's already done. So, you know, I've got it. And I use the Dairy NZ one and then just do that. And then every time there's a payout change, I might change something. Or as I know, if we've got projects, major projects going on, I will do a base budget. And then through the year, I'll add in the development projects mm. into that. But it's a key thing to it. And using the Dairy NZ templates is very easy. And Nathan and myself, we both do it and uh, we flick our budgets to each other and we work through. So every time there's a change in payout, there's, a, there's actually a change. But we find that a good process. The other one that we use is the balance sheet one, which we know how we're growing in, in business and and different things like that. Mm. And we use that one even if we're looking at, at doing things. So basically the, um, the only budgeting profiles we use are the ones on the Dairy NZ website. And in the real tough cash flow years, we will do a full cash flow budget. So we know know how to get through that. <laughs> this time, with higher payout, we don't. But with looking at downturns, we actually use the cash flow budget so we know when the cash is coming and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And also, we in the cash book, we see the cash flow, but cash flow in that too, so we use those so we know. And that's what we monitor because I'll know what's coming ahead and also tells us when we can actually pay debt off. And both Nathan and myself, we use those principles. We figured out, you know, looking at the payment predictor on Fonterra, where the cash, when the cash is going to be there, you just pay your loans off then. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a cash flow tool that we actually use. Thanks, John. Great stuff. Hey, I'll put links to those Dairy NZ tools in the show notes for any listeners who want to give them a try. John, you don't prepare various budgets, you know, scenarios based on different milk prices? The key, impo key important thing that I do is I see at the bottom of it is a cash surplus of $2.46. The payout in the budget is $8.50. That means my break-even payout is $6. And that's how I work it. That difference, that, that difference there tells me whether I've either got a screw cost and do that. So that's the critical one that I work out. And so that's pretty important, the cash that's left over after all your drawings, tax and everything else. And that's the one that you know where your break even payout is. And so I guess that's my monitoring tool. It's, it's a simple one, but it's worked well over the years. 
for you know how much cash surplus that you've actually got. Good stuff. Thanks, John. Hey, and, and Kylie, when do you start your budgeting process for the next season? How do you go about it? And same question I asked John just then, do you prepare various uh, scenario budgets? Yeah, so our, our budgets for next season are also already completed. Uh, we had to get them done this year, sort of late November, early December, uh, partly because we needed prior approval from the banks to grow our, our herd numbers next season. So I base them off the current season so far and add sort of 5% of you know, increases in costs and also merge in the dairy holdings template of their expected costs and income for the farm. So I sort of merge mine and theirs together to, to come out with one. Um, but just because it's done now doesn't mean to say it sits there and, and does nothing. It actually, we update it all the time. We know what tax is coming out when, so that gets added in and, and also use that to time if we need capital purchases around tax payments and GST. We know using that budget tool to of when the best time to do that. No, we don't prepare different budgets for different scenarios, uh, but we do use the Dairy NZ cost, the sensitivity report, just so we know where the threats and opportunities are for us with our budget. So, yeah. Yeah, excellent stuff. Thank you, Kylie. A final question for both of you. Are there any lessons that you've learned from previous downturns or challenging times that you'd recommend to other business managers? You know, any advice that you've got to offer from, from experiences you've been through? Really start building, well, you should already have built good positive relationships. And we keep communicating with those people in our business team, the bank managers, financial advisors, accountants, your farm owners, um, and for us, our farm supervisor, just keep that communication going and keep in touch with them often. Know your numbers. Like we do our own GST, our own budgets. So we know we've got our finger on the pulse. And I think you need to do that. I pick up different things. You know, we're spending too much on a bike. Okay, it's time to buy a new one. A really good understanding around that. We completed mark and measure and we found a lot from that. And each year since then, we have inputted our numbers into, into the dairy base. And that gives us a that gives us so much clarity around where we are now and where we want to go and to benchmark us against other contract milkers. And I mean, during the tough times, I've worked off farm, I've ended up out at Ensco and in the sheep yards. Just uh, I knew that we had grazing to pay. How were we going to pay it? Couldn't the way we were, so I went and got another job. So it's just you make it work and. During our cash flows and our budgets, I knew that there was a major gap there and, and we just filled it. We just had to, had no choice and yeah, and it worked and it works for us. Mm, that's uh, great stuff. Thank you, Kylie. Hey, and John, same question to you. Any advice learned from previous challenging times? The main thing is basically um, know where you're at at that point financially and look real hard at your budget, what you can do. The other thing that I principle that I've used, and we've had quite a few hard years over the year, over the forty three years we've been farming, and a little catchphrase I use: use the resources you got on the farm, because you've got more there than you think. Instead of going out and buying something, you might have a pipe fitting sitting in the back of the shed. Instead of going and buying another one, all those little things. Use your resources that you've got, and at the time of a downturn, you just Put the checkbook away and you and you minimise and also, but you put the inputs in that you get the best stock performance that you can get out of it. And I think if I look back over my business over the years, probably the, the lean years is probably when I've got the best performance out of my cows because you actually focus a lot more on, on, what's, on what's actually important. When the payouts get high, you get sloppy, and but put real disciplines into it. The other thing I would say at the moment, which is very critical to dairy farmers right now, is everyone's got a cost squeeze. Your staff have too. So to actually screw them back right now and not give them pay rises is not going to help your business. And that's why I think last last April I gave my guys a 6 7% pay rise. Yeah, you know, just to meet the cost of living. And we'll be doing the same this year. It'll affect our budget, but it'll actually keep our farm producing better it'll hold the staff and other things like that so it's something that you think oh maybe you can cut it out but 
they are facing the same pressures in, in the daily life more so than what we are in our businesses. So it's probably a critical area to think and uh, staff's hard to get anyway, but keep the guys that you've got, got and look after them. And the other thing is when you come out of a downturn, there will be opportunities to get yourself financially ready, to actually utilise those ones. And that's what I say to you, Kylie, there will be some opportunities if, if things really get tight that, that come out. But if you've got the cash and you've got, got the relationships with the banks and the other things, they will actually back you. And that's where over the 40, 43 years we've made our biggest gains. People have said to me, why are you buying farms right now? Because it was the right time. Yeah, if you know what I mean. So there are, and that's what's helped us over the years, but having those key financial disciplines. And if you, I mean, not everyone can do it, but use people that actually have got those skills to actually do it. But you probably need to manage your own business. And having dealt with a lot of farmers over the years and wives, husband and wives as a team, you work as a team. Yes. And that's probably the critical thing that, that, that way, Jill and I, Jill wouldn't know what, how much I owed, we owed. But when it comes to the big decisions, she makes the decisions. So like as a team, and in most couples, you are a team. Yes. And it's what I call, what I've seen over the years, successful couples uh, where the couple factor and where they work together with, this, with the same purpose and work together. On, and, and, and that's where the success actually comes through. It's, it's what I call the couple factor. Mm. Words of wisdom from both of you. Thank you so much, John and Kylie, for joining me on the podcast and for sharing so candidly about what you're doing on your farms, you know, in your businesses. I know our listeners will have got a lot from what you've both had to say. So thank you very much and all the best for the rest of the season. Thank you very much for having me. Yep. Thanks for tuning into Talking Dairy. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to check out more of our podcasts, go to dairynz.co.nz forward slash podcast or find us on your favorite podcast platforms. Catch you next time.